Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of Carolyn Talks. I am your host Carolyn Heinz and this is the podcast slash YouTube channel where I talk to film creators about their work, the industry and what inspires them. And this is an episode that's going to be part of my South by Southwest 2022 coverage. And for that, I'll be today I'll be speaking with director Damien Marcano to talk about his new feature film Cheese, which is hilarious. It had me, I watched it with my sister and we were dying and I can't wait to get into this film. But first I'd like Damien to talk a bit about himself and what got him into filmmaking and then what created what inspired you to create cheese. Um we'll do one at a time. Let's see. So what um what got into filmmaking? Uh what got me into filmmaking, man? I just wanted to tell stories, you know, it's like you try to find a way I've been, I've been painting my whole life. And um, when I was like seven or eight years old, I used to paint. I really like took it seriously. And, you know, a canvas is four corners, right? So a screen is four corners, kind of the same thing. So um, I think film is just, you know, became the medium over the years, right? I needed to do something visual and I got addicted to motion and those kind of things, man. But I had um I had somebody lend me a camera. Uh, probably the first person I thought I would have an eye to do something visual. They lent me a Super 8 film camera. And I hung on to it for about a year. I never ended up using the camera. So I ended up feeling like I really let that person down. And that I think might have been the moment that I said, you know what? I didn't expect this reaction from them. So maybe I should go and look up whatever. So I took the camera back to him. And he knew I was playing around. So he said, you know what? Do me a film, just at least study glass, like begin to look up lenses and glass and whatnot. And I begin to look them up because uh, out of guilt, right? I felt bad. And I fell in love with glass from the World War II era. Uh -huh. Like it, it was it was something about it. It was like, I was like, man, I kind of, as, as an artist, as a painter, I really like the image that you get through this glass. And then that became a whole, un, you know, what would take years was just a progression of an artist and me trying to figure out, uh, you know, not figure out if this is something I wanted to do or I was trying to perfect film, but just, I think in anything you create as an artist, whether it is music, whether it is photography, whether it is painting, whether it's illustration, no matter what, it has to be at a point where you feel something. And I think I was just, I was chasing this, trying to find a feeling, you know, it was like, it, it, it sort of tickled my spirit a little bit. And the more and more we tried it and the more and more I would mess up, let's say, is the more and more I fell in love with it. You know, it's like you keep, you keep, bunk, you know, banging your head up against something and you might say, man, I'm really in love with just banging my head up against something. Why do I keep coming back for more? Every time is hard. It doesn't get any easier. Mm. But when I would look to my left and I would look to my right, I began to realize that I had um, some kind of innate ability to get other people to try these crazy things with me. You know, it's like jumping off the cliff, right? You jump off the cliff and you pray to God that hopefully there is water at the bottom, you know. So that's that's pretty much what I would say definitely got me into filmmaking. Um, you know, when it comes in time to talk about what made me do things like make cheese. Honestly, when I made cheese, I was in, where was I at? I was in Holland. I was actually in Holland. I was at the film festival of Rotterdam. So, you know, I've been making things at this point, right? I've been shooting videos. I've been uh, shooting commercials and whatnot. But I was in Holland and I was freezing my ass off, kind of like you were talking when we started talking today. And every time I walked, into a ray of sunlight i thought man that feels good and when i get back to the island you know what i'm gonna make something called walking with the sun that was a terrible title walking with the sun was what cheese was before i just called it cheese and, and you know when i got back to when i got back home my wife literally said to me when i got back from holland because we had been doing everything ads music videos and I was shooting a, a short film in Holland. She said, look, you're going to need to take a break. So she booked this little place down on the countryside, a place called Akaju. And it was like the last, I think it was the second to last village all the way down on the north coast of the island, like the last, last village. And it's called Grand Revere. Mm. So I'm in Grand Revere now and I'm, I'm on this, you know, wife ordered bed rest or whatnot, man. Like it was, I needed a break. But I was walking up the beach and I saw this white guy playing with a Rottweiler. Now, that's not a scene 
I know of and every, you know, every Caribbean island is not commonplace just to see a white man and a large dog playing on the beach. And I thought, did this guy come on vacation and bring this dog with him? Like, what, what is this all about, man? And that guy ended up being um, Piero Garini, who plays Mr. Otoni in She's the Film. And in a long conversation on the beach that day, he literally told me, I make cheese in the jungle. But I don't know why you would have any interest on seeing that. And I said, why not? So tomorrow, my wife and I will come with you and we're going to check out this cheese establishment or whatever it is you're doing. And, you know, to be honest with you, little did he know at the time that he was talking to an artist who was trying to put something together. Right. So we drove into the jungle the next day and there it was literally a brick and mortar structure. We go inside and this man is making cheese and we started cheese tasting. So here we are in this little island village doing some Napa Valley type of wine and cheese tasting. And <laughs> he's making us premium ricotta and my wife is having cognac and chocolates with it. And, you know, the thing is, he's quite a chef. Um, and he just really told me the thing that stuck with me was he told me many years ago he came to the island because he was a photographer for Time magazine. He fell in love with the island and decided to rent a room long term and then eventually bought the place. So when you watch cheese and I say things in there like white people are crazy, but I really admire that about them. That's where it comes from. You know, cheese is just a very honest. Um, it's like I wrote it. So it's very honest. It's um, very honest based on the people I think I had the experiences with before making it or while making it or during and after and all of that. So. Mm. I love the film because one of the, the things about it, like we're talking about being from the islands, like you're from Trinidad and from Barbados. And like, just for me, I could, I watched it with my twin sister and like, we've been living here in Canada. This is um, going on 13 years this year. November would have been 12 years. And like, we miss home. We miss home so much. Like we've been back home, but there's something like being able to just watch Caribbean culture on a film and and like it just like i was like this is the first like honestly you're the first caribbean first west indian filmmaker that i've been able to talk to since i started doing film criticism i've spoken to people who are um who have west indian heritage you know like if their their parents are expats and like immigrated to england but you're the first um like direct from home um filmmaker so like that this means so much to be able to just talk to you about this and just to be able to see a film that i would just like Trinidadian and like Caribbean and Barbadian culture are like different. Like also people like each island has its very own way of doing things. Yes, but we tried to find the common thread because see, through my work, I travel to all these different places, right? My, my wife and her entire family is Jamaican. So I needed to make something like I spent time in Curacao. I spent time in Holland and even see all of the, uh, other people from other islands that are over there. And I was trying to make something for everybody. I was trying to make something that even at the same time, a skimmer could make someone in America, someone in Canada or whatever from a small town feel the same way, right? Skimmer is from a small town and he wants to get out and do something larger than life with his life. His small town just happens to be on a rock in the sea. And I think that's the part that island people like you and myself can tell that story in a way that even the American writer can't tell. Yeah. Right? A small town experience they're still here, right? At the end of the day, the American creative can still, or the American skimmer could get in a car if they feel pissed off enough and drive out of that small town and drive to a bigger city and say, I'm gonna try life here. And for us, it's so much time we spend around dreaming about the possibility of what could be or the this man. And, you know, we try to keep those honest tones in there as well. But I'm glad you said that because this, you know, you guys are who it was all for, man. Like. You know, me writing the part of Skimmer was, I think, a person just like yourself, where I spend so much time here. You go back home, you have all the people that you love and you care about, and you realize that even though you're here and you're making what you're making of life, the Skimmers back home have no clue about the struggle that you have here, mm -hmm. right? And, and then when we get back home, too, the Skimmers back home sometimes, if they get frustrated enough, will tell us, man, you don't understand because you're not on the ground. Right, because we all know island life on the ground is different. It's Very a different than just being there for a couple of weeks at a time. So, you know, doing the script was just a way to hopefully, I don't know, hopefully honor and somehow make everybody just feel like this wasn't just from, you know, this thing started in Trinidad. I finished it in Tobago 
and it was still supposed to make Jamaicans and Bayesians and everybody feel like, yeah, this was home. Mm. No, it's true. You said something about um, like when we are on when we we're back home in the Caribbean, like we want to leave. Like for many people, like I was telling someone this um, before, like so many of our people back home never leave the islands. Like my grandmother never left Barbados, never. Right. And yeah. my mom, like once she was able to, like she started to travel. She went to, she's been to uh, Caracas, you know, she's been to New York. She's been to England yeah. and all these other places. And my sister and I, like we've been to other like um, islands in the Caribbean. I've been to St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis. And I want to mm-hmm. go to Trinidad and Tobago and to Guyana because my mom's side of the family is from Guyana. So I want to go to like other places uh-huh. in the Caribbean as well. Right. And like, but, but I remember there's something that we always say like back home, like there's only two ways off of an island in the Caribbean. That's by air and by sea. And both ways are extremely hard. If you don't know how to swim, you 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 you, you must luck in the water. If you if you got if you got money for airfare, well, all right. It's so true. it's so true, man. There was a time I remember before we even shot cheese. Uh, three of us were sitting on the beach. We were in Mayaro in the south, and um, we were looking at this oil rig, and we just thought about it. We said, man. If we were sitting here 60 years ago, would we try to make it out to that oil rig? It's just the, you know, sometimes it's the nonsense things that we talk about at mm-hmm. home because everything is talk, right? Anything could become talk. <laughs> and I think part of my way of script writing this was saying, all right, but when I'm home, because that's the difference of a more westernized life like America, Canada and all that. When I'm, at, when I'm here, I don't do as much small talk with people in my community. But when I get back home and I see the fact that we have this spirit, I tend to listen with this other ear. You know, this other ear that's like, man, I know we're talking nonsense right now, but you know, fellas, we're really talking about our dreams and our hopes and our aspirations. And it, yeah, it used to be at a time people used to tell me, man, I think that's your weed talking, you know, like you must be really, smoke something real good today. And yeah, while that could be the case as well, it opened my mind up. You know, it opened my mind up to say that this isn't just small talk between people on the beach right because now here i am in hollywood in my career and i'm a a gilded director and i shoot all of these big shows and i do all of these things and yet and still the scene in which skimmer and peter talk on the beach is one of the best scenes i've still ever done in my career because every show that i book in this town they all see cheese they've all seen the short film version of it Mm-hmm. They all saw that scene of Skimmer and Peter on the beach, or at least the first initial cut of it. And it blew everyone's mind away. And it was all because I took a simple thing that we do, which is, yeah, liming on the beach with your brethren at night. You have nothing to do. Neither one of you all have a girlfriend or a loved one because it's a small village, a small island village, man. And, yeah, you're just there. You talk, and you talk about your aspirations. But what I always realize is that, in traditional island liming or when we get together we are also very good debaters yes so hence the reason that peter is not just going to agree with you and say yeah yeah imagine us if we could be out there peter doesn't ask him about what's in it for him all the way to the end right the whole time peter is like boy you crazy boy you see how much money we just make here when the day come we eat any fish the fish good everything that skimmer was downplaying Peter was like, no, 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 it's not that bad. This is the most beautiful place on earth, man. And all Skimmer was saying is you never been anywhere else but here. And you saying this is the most beautiful place in the world. And then that just speaks to the fact of so many island people are, you know, generations before you and I, who may have raised us up, all, all sometimes were guilty of treating us like where we came from was just that. Yeah. Right? Like they... They knew everything else about everything in the world. And as you said, some of those people in your family, just like it's in my family, they never left the island. So these are the questions that the youth start to ask after a while, which is, well, shit, how is this the greatest place on earth? Or why am I working so hard just to be in Caribbean society or become the next taxi man or the next this, right? When... Honestly, it's based on what we were taught. And we were taught that for some of us, we were taught that those borders were it. Yeah. Like, you know, your life is here. It lives and dies here, man. Mm, but, but the thing is, is like one thing I love about films like this, especially with conversations like that, you're saying like they back home when you're on the beach, like, like liming or even on the block climbing, you know, like yeah. I've had some of the most philosophical, deep conversations I've had is, or, or, or I've overheard, you know, or even just like at the bus stop. 
like people have yep. these super deep philosophical discussions and, and a lot of it and like it just like makes you think like how coming from like our experience of living in North America, how people have don't really understand island life. They like they think it's like you know, everything iry, you know, is all laid back. And it, the world is laid back because when I go home, the pace is like completely different. But like they don't under they don't really see us as people who have like these kind of conversations who do think about life beyond the border. Even the life within our within our islands is way more than they give us credit for. And they just love that you show like the, the dialogue may seem like may not seem as deep to them, but to us who know the language, who know the syntax and all the context, and I'm gonna definitely get into that, know like how, like just like we may use simple words, quote unquote, but there is nothing simple about the context of what we're talking about. And, uh, and you know, that was the thing I began to see here, even in my, you know, my sort of daily line of work, as I like to call the shows and stuff that I have to do here, is that, you know, a lot of people that would sort of ask me to come help them on their shows or to make their shows better, they would look at these things and they began to take them exactly that way because they would tell me things like, you know, anytime I've seen the Caribbean captured, it was everybody that's in cheese would sort of be a background extra in a scene starring some larger than life movie stars. Right. And it's like we ended up saying, no, the lens shouldn't be on, his to on the tourists this time. The lens should be on the guys who help the tourists out. And I think for the first time, people here got a chance to just say, wow, is that what you guys are talking about when we're on vacation down there? Because you'll see it throughout the film. Every now and again, you will see a little tourist walk by and some white people drinking in the back and whatnot. <laughs> we wanted it to feel like that. We wanted it to feel just like this is how life is for us. We really don't see you until you pull out money and it's time to tip for something or to have us do something or, you know, is we going wherever the money is, man. But if there's no money being exchanged, which is at our regular times that we are now interacting at life. Well, now the white tourists are just the, the background extras putting some towels at a beach chair in a car. And I think that's hopefully something that we also get a little, um, you know, a little chuckle, man. But overall, Jesus vibes, you know, it's um, I think that was like the one thing with every scene. Even as we went all the way to, to edit and to put this thing together, it was always making sure that as we would piece the scenes together, that they had that vibe. Like it wasn't just about, man, like we got to get the best performance out of this. Obviously, you want that. You want that as a filmmaker, as a director and whatnot. But it was also about I needed to feel very honest. You know, one of the biggest things I have is when I'm home, anywhere in the islands and I turn the lens on, I always sometimes accuse some of the male actors of turning into Denzel when I say action. <laughs> because it's like, they forget the reason I even casted them. And for a while I ended up realizing that it wasn't so much that they forgot, but for a while the belief was that, why would you cast me, hmm. right? I'm not, I'm not an actor, I'm not this, but like, like you know, a long time ago, we had a, a gentleman named Lee Scratch Perry, right? And he ended up getting with a guy named Robert Nesta Marley and they ended up making a bunch of things that the whole world would still sing to this point. And the only thing I could really find in their formula was that to keep it so pitiful that anybody would have to believe it. Mm -hmm. And my way of storytelling is the same way. I think my way of working has become the same way because even with, you know, like my, my other show that I'm, uh, the Lakers uh, show, the Winning Time show just premiered here in LA. And I remember doing, you know, working on that show with people like John C. Riley and Adrian Brody and Jason Clark, Rob Morgan. These guys are all huge names, right? Huge stars. I don't have anybody on the island, anything at all like these guys. So my job on it all, as it is when I work with all of these guys, honestly, is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm working with Riley and Brody and Rob Morgan and those guys, it is about reminding them, you know, I think this is why we cast you to do this part. There's a certain something that you do that I find that e each of them have their own respective lightning in a bottle. Yes. And so Akil who plays Skimmer, Harry who plays Peter, Yida who plays Rebecca, they all have the same lightning in a bottle. You know, was, these are just people that I think is a side effect of being a Rasta man too, right? You go around, you talk to a bunch of people like, as, as Rastas, we end up with all kinds of friends, man. And <laughs> You end up just meeting so many people that you end up saying, well, I can either just look at this for this or I can kind of look at people and personalities as sort of like a color palette mm -hmm. so that 
just as a Lee Scratchberry would go in the neighborhood and find six fellas to just come and sing some backgrounds on a record. It wasn't just six fellas to him. He knew that those tones were exactly what he was looking for. So when I, at this point, tell some fellas in my neighborhood back home, yes, yeah, the six of y'all, I need to do this. At first, it used to be a little crazy, like, you sure? But now that we have started to make a little sweet reggae music with the thing, more people start to believe and a little, you know, one or two jump in here and one or two jump in there. And the greatest thing I love about it all is that I don't have, I'm, I'm not a Hollywood studio, right? So I don't have the budget to pay them essentially what they could possibly make in the Hollywood system. Mm. So the agreement that I usually have with all island people or people outside of this Hollywood system when we film is to, is to just have a, a simple agreement that I will not embarrass you. Okay, because just like everyone could say, well, Damien, after this, man, you know, you're going to get enough playing and you're going to fly out of here. You're going to go back to L.A. and put this thing together. I still have to take the taxi. I still have <laughs> through town so if what you put out with me is embarrassing i might not be able to get a walk people might be able to look at me and say oh that's that fella from that and i and i'm always a joke every mm -hmm. season so it, it, i swear it's almost like i don't want to say it's harder because they're not harder but i put so much more care and attention into the work that i do down there because of that because at the end of the day i know that these huge performers here at the end of the day there's no way i'm going to embarrass them yeah right there's a meeting of the minds when we get together that's me bringing my talent to the table them bringing their talent and let's work where we are back home is i'm at the point where we're just kind of coaching some people to get to that point where they know the type of performer that they are so that we and we have them there but it's just that we need to build an industry around them so that these people can become the Sydney Portiers and the Harry Belafonte's and who they're supposed to be. But I, I just find that we're in such a brilliant time of life now that I almost feel like the Sydney's and the Harry's don't have to leave Trinidad or Barbados or, or Bahamas or wherever to make it. I think they could kind of stay home now. And if hopefully if some of my hard work pays off, we'll be able to also get the studio side of things that happens here mm -hmm. is to get there, which is always been sort of the overall goal um, yeah. in some capacity whether it be just having a better infrastructure built so that we can continue to put out projects or whether it be that i'm working on a sound stage and we finally get a sound stage up there so that i can do a lot more when i get there you know the whole point and it's not just me it's, it's about building an industry because i am part of a successful industry here right i just want the same hopefully successful industry to kind of happen down where we at Hmm. And speak and you said so much things that I want to touch on and actually worry my questions. But the first thing I want to start, talk about is um, the cast. So they're novices to acting, right? As you said, like they're like this, like they're not professional actors, but they sometimes what I love about when you have films or even like um, especially for independent cinema is that it is able to give a realness to the characters that allows us to connect so much more. And like for this one, like we, the other side I watched with my sister and like we, we laughed like the, almost the entire time because like these are people that we know, right? These are people that we interacted with back home. Like this is, is like village thing. And like we, you, it would be different if it was like, um, if the if the cast was like professional actors and you know, they have like super polished performances. I'm like, no, I like the ruggedness of the acting because it feels so real. Like the the dialogue is the dialogue yeah. is realistic like these are the types of conversations like one of my favorite scenes is the scene at the dinner at the table with the ladies from the church like that's one of my favorite because i grew up in like in the church right i grew up in both pentecostal and some of that many church but like it's all the same no matter what denomination when the late when the church ladies get get around and start talking the discussion is the exact same way and i'm like yeah that's exactly what that's exactly how the conversations would go so i love that and then like and then and for the cast like i think like akil does such a fantastic job all of them are really good like they have these they still are able to feel comfortable in front of the camera you can tell that as you as a director allow them to be themselves and also be com um, comfortable in front of the camera because you can tell when um, new new actors, new performers, new, new performers aren't comfortable with the environment, that usually comes through in the performances, and that didn't feel like this in the film to me. And actually, you can tell from the progression. I want to ask if you actually filmed um, in um, uh, chronologically, in like time wise, because it, I could feel how they became more natural 
in front of the camera and they were just like naturally interacting with each other. No, everything was just shot. It was all shot out of sequence. So I don't know. Really? It was, it was just, um, yeah, it was all shot. It was all put together in a production schedule because we had sort of two months to finish it once we got to Tobago. So it was mm. all based on people's availability and travel and all of that stuff. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how did you go about selecting them? Because um, so like I love um, Akila Skimmer, and then uh, we, we talked about Peter. Like their discussion is so good. They have this really good chemistry on screen. But then also Parrot, like to me, he's hilarious. Like the expression Parrot. that he had. <laughs> yeah, Parrot is um, Parrot is like very is amazing. I mean, these are all guys that you know we've all tried things over the years, right? Like um, so I don't want to say like yeah, they just started like or. You know, I don't like to call people not professional actors just because of where I'm at. Because honestly, some of the people that they send me from Australia, I'm not that impressed with. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's acting is based on where the audience is, and I think you know, 30 years ago we had, I don't want to say it, but we just had a stupider audience, and they were into shit that just was was slower and stupider. To be honest. I mean, to be honest with you, because if you ask a lot of people, even in the city where I live, you know, you want to be in today's world or do you want to be in the world 30 years ago? And that's sort of what I'm referring to. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that that, you know, the audience were, were idiots, but no, I'm I just saying it was a certain accepted status quo 30 years ago that I don't think exists any longer. And I think when we see it in, in performers like Zendaya on um, Euphoria, um, just certain people, but she's one that definitely comes to mind, which are people that can take on a role that is nothing of them and still do it in such a human way. As I said before, it has to be pitiful like reggae music so you will believe it. It's the only reason. It's the only reason people are still singing Whaler songs. If Whaler songs were these lovely, perfectly produced things by the best record producer in Jamaica at the time, no, it took, it took a human being in Scratch Berry and another human being to get together to say, yeah, well, I think we can maybe do some human things here, man. And that is my formula with it all. It's just that when I see it coming through the screen, you know, whether I'm even doing the cinematography and sometimes I don't get the luxury of sitting in the chair and just staring at it through the screen, it has to feel like something to me. That's that's what I am able to, um, whether it's cheese, or whether it's any other production that I'm doing, whether it's something here, whether it's something there it all has to feel right i think essentially that's what these major studios pay me for here it's like you know i'm able to watch up and just call out the bullshit and just say no 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 man we're going to get it i do the same thing with these guys they aren't just it doesn't just come off like that when we film um you know every take probably has especially when you have multiple actors in a scene every scene just as here in hollywood there's a mess up there's a a miss something of a line or whatnot but the way that i always like to work is not to tell talent no you know when you tell talent no and you're going with too many notes all actors here is i did everything wrong 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 he does not want this i tend to work more so from well listen here's what you gave me on that one on this one try something else and and i'll be specific with what i want them to try the you know, that that sort of then sends me back to the editing room now with this sort of ca multiple cadences of performance. It's like going back to the edit room with 43 versions of one song and saying, mm -hmm. man, you just got one song out of this. So you have out of 43 things, maybe them 20, 20 of them are terrible. And you're like, I can't use any of this. And out of that half, you say, all right, I'm going to use this part for this and I'll put this part for the bridge. And yeah, it's the same thing when we go into post, you know, these are the luxury that I have because we do not have an industry where we are from is you don't have to just mail in your work. You could like really sit and take the time and turn the work and turn the scenes because there's no studio breathing down my neck to say this has to be done this way. And there's no guild that's there that's like this has to be done and you can't shoot today because the guild bylaw says no, we're in, we in the wild, wild west in the Caribbean making this film right now. So I also think it is a, it's just such an amazing time to be making some art from our region. Whatever it is you're doing, there's this brilliant, brilliant talent that I see coming up. And I think with my aspect of what I'm doing, I'm just trying to be as real with it as possible so that, you know, whether it's 20 years from now, people see these things that we make, 
I just want them to say, yeah, I felt, I feel like, man, I still believe it, right? Like, it's so 30 years from now, we're not looking at cheese saying, oh, man, I don't know. I would not want it to be around then. It's like, no, let's do this so honest that they have to believe it. Let's really find that. And if, if people didn't leave the scenes feeling like that, then we would reshoot. We would do stuff. There were, there were scenes in there that we definitely went back and reshot. When we had the short film, we had a short film version, we even had a completely different Rebecca. Mm. So we had to go and reshoot all of this stuff over when we decided to do um, the feature. And the first Rebecca was brilliant. I mean, she was like amazing. But like I said, with our schedule, but when we went back to make the feature of this and because everything was out of sequence, we actually just couldn't get her to do it at the, at the selected dates. Mm. Okay. Um, um, but so speaking about keeping things real and honest, um, the subtitles for the dialogue. I found to be very interesting because their structure, not only do they not turn up like in a specific way, like some drop down, some drop up and like they crisscross, which I thought was interesting to do for subtitles. But then it kind of made me think of like that, that you talked about the cadence, like how uh, Westin is talking, like kind of to me, it kind of felt like the flowing, like how the dialogue flows. But then um, like what you did with it was so interesting because like they're speaking in the dialect. So you're adding um, like proper English version of the of the dialogue. But then like I talked about the scene with the ladies, that one was interesting because you kind of switched it up where you actually start to add more context and like you mm -hmm. were kind of interpreting what they were saying. Like when she would say, I am the, I'm, I'm the head deacon and she, and you, and you put like, I'm the head bitch in charge. I'm like, cause you're adding the subtext of what she's saying. The subs are the, the subs are their own character, you know, in cheese. Um, that started when I did a project called the fire queen and I just kept it. I just kept it going. Mm -hmm. Um, Fire Queen is something that's on YouTube. You could check that out. But it's exactly the same. Um, I just tried it then and people really seemed to like it. So it was when we were doing this, it was like, all right. Um, and then some of the scenes, I think even like the church lady scene, I wanted to say more. I wanted to just like not have the audience. I think people back home would have got what those women were saying. But um, the outside audience, uh, I wanted to have the subs be, yeah, be this other character so that people could say, just not just have a laugh. <laughs> what let like let outside in on the joke you know because i'm sure these people I, I mean i heard it living in this country at times where you know my mother could be pissed at me for something and would tell it to me in a way and my friends my american friends would say man your mother is so nice where when i read the subtitles under what she was saying you know so um yeah that's that's the whole reason for the subs man it just um it was something tried and it really just worked with the palette of cheese the palette of cheese is just i don't know man is this do something crazy it's not it's not to it's not just meant to be you know that slow thing that people watch and say oh it's an indie and we didn't have money no nah, man we wanted to make people who still had to who acted in our show and they still had to take the bus and still had to take taxi after we wanted because when we did the short that's what happened when we did the short people was at the taxi stand and people would be like hey that's you from cheese and it became this insanely prideful thing that i could have never offered to anybody when i first said hey you want to do this project with me All right this became this thing that people were literally calling me i'm here in la and people are calling me, giving me stories. Like Skimmer was, um, Skimmer was in, in uh, taking some classes at the time. And he would call me just saying things of like this. And his professor stopped the lecture one day and was like, you know, like Akeel and Cheese, like Mr. Williams and Cheese. <laughs> and where we from, this does not happen, right? Where we from, even if you are a collegiate student, your parents are all about you going to college to learn, to make sure you get that degree to become doctor, to become a lawyer, to become something. Not, not to be hailed up in a classroom for playing the ass, right? You know, like, like that's, not, that's not what they're looking for. And, you know, but I remember weeks ago when I spoke to Skimmer's mother, and i never forget the day that I met Skimmer's mother. Um, we were, he used to smoke on some steps down by where his place is and uh, where they live. And uh, where my aunt's house was, was not far, just up the hill from there. So I used to call him and we'd go down there. We had a little smoke spot and they would drink and stuff. I was never to drink. I would just smoke. So his mother came by, come, was coming home one night and we never even saw her park the car. So as she came up on us, it's just a cloud of smoke. <laughs> we were brainstorming back then 
about how to make cheese and how to like do all of these little ideas that we wanted. And I never forget that night meeting her and I'm like, oh yes, hello, hi, uh, Miss Gemma, how are you, da da da. And I never forget, we always joke that she did this like tiptoe around us and she just kind of gave that island mommy pleasant good evening. Yes, 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 all right. But we knew when he went inside, he was going to get talk, right? He was going, he was bound to get talk because as any parent would be down there, just like a lot of people are running to now, they say, look, my son saw you on TV. My daughter saw you on TV. Is this film thing good to go into, right? Because <laughs> we haven't been taught anywhere else. So I gave you that story about him just to say, you know, that was over seven years ago. And to say that seven years now, and my conversation with his mother is completely different, which is like her just really rooting for him and seeing this and, and not just seeing it, but now taking a full ownership and even what we are making. That's more than just saying, hey, I got cool with your mother, right? Now we're at the point where his mother believes in the dream. You know mm -hmm. that, man, we really could make something happen out of this. And I think that part of it all, man, sometimes doesn't even happen here in the big Hollywood system. Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of it, a lot of the things in this system is just to throw money at things. But for me, I don't know. It's weird, man. Like if you could maybe go out somewhere and do something with a little project like this that has more heart than we had money. Um, you know, it's like for some of us, that's like that's the bragging rights we would prefer to have. Right. No, it's true. I, I totally relate because like when I first started to do film criticism and journalism, my mom was just like, excuse me. Like I, a... you know, she like, excuse me, because I have, I got it. I was doing paralegal studies, right? I was doing a, my college diploma, paralegal studies. I got the diploma, and she's like, yeah, you better go work in an office. I'm like, she's like, you need an office job. I'm like, I don't want to. I want to do. I want to do this. So like, I like it's like the same like back home. Like, it's get your tertiary education. Good if you get a UE, <laughs> you know, University of West Indies. Get a UE, get your diploma, your bachelor degrees, whatever, and go and find an office job. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know, it's like the system is already there for us. And, you know, it just, man, like for me, it's like, I, what's the best way to say it, man? Like, I'm, I, I am from MOVA. I'm not just from Port of Spain, but I'm from MOVA, which is on the hill, right? It's Laventil Hill. This is where people usually tell tourists and whatnot, hey, you don't go up there, right? I don't know. All of our islands have it. I don't know if Barbados have an area that you all tell people, hey, man, you might want to go in there. But as my uncle would say growing up, the bad men come from the hill and we came from the tippy top. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a stigma in the news, you know, regarding violence and regarding the crime. And, and most of us from my community are looked down on because of that. Like if a guy from my from Laventil or Mova says he's going to go apply for a job somewhere. By the time he writes his address down, they're not going to hire him. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, we don't want no fellas from your neighborhood to come here and create no problems and thing, thing, thing. You just get that as the as the status quo, right? The, the, the blanket answer. So for me, I decided to name everything I do, which was in writing and directing and all the stuff I would do in this town, I decided to name it Mova which is just the phonetic pronunciation of the neighborhood, M-O-V-A. Yeah. And really, that allowed me to redefine the feeling of the neighborhood when you hear its name. Because now when you hear about MOVA, you just don't hear about things that happen in a MOVA. Now everything that we do, cheese is a MOVA picture. MOVA is at South by Southwest. And, you know, it's like sometimes people tell me that's like billionaire way of thinking, right? Because a billionaire says, in order to change the area, I'm going to change the price of apples. Mm. And if I make three dollars everybody's gonna move people are gonna say it's too expensive to live around here so without the money and without that status you know this is sort of our attempt at using the art to redefine you know where we come from to redefine not even just where we come from but on a greater scale any youth or people that come from our countries our islands that there is another option there's another possibility other than just going to UE. there's so many people i'm sure that you even grew up with on an island that just loved art that wanted to, if, if they could further their skills in art, but there was no outlet in which to do so, you know? So I think Cheese has, man, Cheese got a lot, a lot on its plate, you know, cause I'm really hoping that it could become the beginning of the better times, you know? No, I, I hope it does. And I can see that it does because like, yeah, West Indian people have so much talent. So many of us are 
artists in different ways like you know there's like the painting and the sculpture but like so many of them are like visual artists like want to do like filmmaking but there's as you said there's no infrastructure right like growing up in the caribbean like we have like you know small productions you know you would have like the small tv productions um, for the local broadcasting show and those kind of things and i remember the only big production that we would that we that would have been on tv when i was growing up was royal palms you know that jamaica the jamaica the jamaica so far bro, right oh, wow yeah you see what i'm saying like and it's like everybody has these ones that we remember somebody from um somebody from tobago the other day just blew my mind because i never knew that swiss family robinson was filmed in tobago hmm. and they said um their parents had passed but they said listen my mother and father always used to talk about when is film going to come back to this island and i ended up looking it up only to realize yeah the movie swiss family robinson was filmed on the island of tobago yeah but i don't know it, where we were heading at one point that we just we, it, it kind of stopped right because like we had like and then like people would talk about like if but then thinking about the caribbean like everyone focuses on jamaica because like jamaica you know like they had like the um films like tambourine seed and the jamaica and like uh, some of the james bond films were filmed um in jamaica and, like the most recent one um die another day like they have scenes filmed in jamaica too but like for right. the rest of the islands like we only had local productions we didn't really have like big um productions wait i'm wrong i just had a memory i think they filmed parts of pirates of the caribbean in st lucia right they so did. yeah so they filmed I, I, some of those but like that's the other thing too, right? It, you know, we also, you and I might just be highlighting what the issue is, is that it's not that there aren't things going on. It's just, it's on different lands, right? And it's like, it's not like we can stand on one island and just see, hey, look what they're doing in St. Lucia over there. But I think that this also speaks to just the fact that even as the West Indies, instead of being so segregated, could do a little bit better job of pulling together. Yeah. Pulling the resources together and saying, I mean, I mean, looking like the resources that we have, the natural geography, the natural architecture, the historical pieces that we have from island to island. And to say, I mean, there's nothing we can't get together and do, you know, between a co-island production or mm -hmm. this or that with multiple airports and whatnot. And obviously, someone here will most likely get a large studio to invest in just that, right? Whether it be a written work of art whether it be you know uh there's so much there's so many to, there's so much already good literature that even comes out of all of our islands right and so there's no shortage of that i think it just takes the person with that vision i, I mean i have quite a few things that i'm up here in the hollywood system pitching and essentially trying to make happen you know and but it's a weird thing for me too man because you get in someone else's system as i'm using myself as the example here you get in someone else's system and you say, okay, I want to do X, Y, and Z so I can take these things and get back to where I am to help with this system. And then people in a whole other system that you're not even of, that you're not even from, accept you and offer you everything you want. You just have to be here to do it, mm -hmm. right? So I'm also trying to keep that in mind to never lose sight of the fact that I have all of these talented performers there. I want to get back. And, it's, and that, that has sort of become the passion and the driving force behind some of my pitches and behind some of my relationships with the studios and people that I work with here and just letting them know, like, hey, you know, I'm really still trying to get back here to do this. Yeah. You know, just, just so that they know, like, it, it's I love working on everything that I work on here. But at, at the end of most of them, I, I am left a little empty, man, because it's like I am a creator as well. Right. I am a writer as well. And I know what I'm able to do if we're with no money when put together with some people from back home. So sometimes there's a part of me that just says, man, like what I got to do just to get some money to get these productions right so that I can. And it's not about the fact that everything needs money because some people are going to say, try one, try one. No, but there is a certain level that we can get these things to that need a basic budget. Yeah. There is a something that we figured out when doing cheese, which was, look, we couldn't pay everybody what they would get on a regular film somewhere else or whatnot, but we paid everybody. We wanted to make sure that they knew what it felt like to be paid in exchange for their work, to actually be treated like actors. Everybody that was in Trinidad was either put on um, a Caribbean Airlines flight or put on a ferry and put up with accommodation in the on the island of Tobago, just so that they could feel how Damien feels when he goes to direct a show. Mm. Because I need them to 
start feeling like this is all regular so that when they talk to their families about it, they can say, no, 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 you know, they took care of all of that, man. Yeah, they fed us, the food was taken care of, we had per diem, we had all of that. You know, and it's just to say that, right, when I can finally get, let's say, Warner Brothers or whoever to come down here with me and do this, well, then we'll be able to pay you scale and then we'll be able to do those things. But, you know, we're just trying to make sure that I think that is also a way of making sure that no one there gets left behind in the process of how this yeah. is all done. All right. So it's not so just brand new to them. Like I think about like our um, our production manager, Taika, who did um, who did everything like she was there in Tobago before we got there and everything. And it was not easy for her to get this done. Um, Cause she was sort of both Alexa and myself before we could even get there. And she would have to devise her own team. You know, this was like telling people we're about to do something on a level that hasn't been done here before. And somehow we have to get it done. And I have no idea. There's no office of this to call. There's no this person to call for this. I need to get 24 people up to the village of Castara for Skimmer's wedding. Like, yeah, right. Is where you even finding 24 people from on the island of Tobago that want to come and be embarrassed possibly, right? It's like, yeah. So I'm sure there's a whole story just about even in just the making of the film cheese, man. But I'm proud with I'm proud with where we are, and I'm really proud that one is the one of the greatest things is, and I think that's just island people tenacity, the belief that all of our cast members and on the crew people and everybody from down there has in the project that I think that even at times the last couple of years has been hard on everyone. It's been, you know, we've been dealing with a pandemic of the world. So even when I myself began to lose a little faith in cheese or what it could be, or was this even going to get done? Mm. It was always great to be able to hear from them, man. And somebody always bugging me, man, D what's going on with cheese, man. What's going on with cheese? Piero, Piero sometimes would text me one day I was directing Snowfall and he just called me out of the blue and he said, man, he was trying to do some land in um, in Grenada, but he gave up. He sees solar and now he's going back to Trinidad and he's in love again. And like they just hit me up about whatever. Right. And I'm like, the tears came to my eyes because I'm like, here I am in Hollywood directing this big, big show. And I love it. I love working with everybody there. But it's like they still can't give me what home is giving me, man. And, and for that, you can't help but have a sadness around the thing that you're completely in love with. Like, I, I don't have to go home. I don't have to shoot anything home anymore. I could probably just go home and be a tourist now for the rest of my life. You mm -hmm. know, I could probably just go buy an acre in Tobago and, and build something nice on it with a view and say, this is where Damien Marcano, Hollywood film director, chose to, you know and I, that, that's not for me though man for yeah. me it's always been about let's try to empower who's around us man like your wealth your wealth is definitely in the people that's all i have known I, I i've never been successful at anything i tried to do on my own you know it's always been around getting around all of these people meeting meeting my wife when i did and her coming in alexa was like the driving force there's, there isn't a person that, that worked on this that wouldn't say yeah man alexa alexa is like the queen that keeps it all together and she's brooklyn born of a jamaican family so the thing is i feel she got like a double dose she got the brooklyn and the jamaican and she was she's just not hearing that some days if you understand so if we all begin to disbelieve in all of ourselves yeah. she's like what, what, what's going on here you'll Get be negative this. Get this up, get this together, we getting this done. Because they're the kings and queens of everything Irie, right? And they know how to practice. And at the end of the day, maybe she might come to me as my wife and in confidence just say, yeah, boy, today today was a hard one, right? But the crew will never know it. The crew will just go back at the end of the day saying, boy, thank God for Alexa, man. I mean, she made me feel like a million dollars. You know, it's like she had she's a great producer because she has a way of making us all feel like this is possible i think when it if it was just me who knows people might just say nah i don't know man the rasta he don't know what you're talking about but <laughs> by the time she gets involved it just it definitely is something that is going to happen and is going to happen well you know so i think to to a degree while we were going through it every day i would say that was like our person that we would always want to make sure we did a good job for you know mm, no i I, like I just love, I love hearing you talk about the whole process and like your, 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 I guess you could say your philosophy as a filmmaker, especially one of West Indian um heritage, and because like for me, like something like something that I would really love to do one day is like to 
go to like the different islands and cover like the different film festivals in the Caribbean. And that's, that's one of my dreams. Like I just want to travel like, around the world to go to different film festivals and talk to filmmakers in the different locations themselves. And like my dream is to like go to like Barbados and like Jamaica and Trinidad, like like do that. So like just hearing you talk about that, like I'm just like, yeah, I'm gonna make that dream come true because it's important that we tr- that we be honest as creators, especially I think as as West Indians and as because like there's so very few of us in this industry, right? And like we have to use our voices, I think, to like give um an honest portrayal of what West Indian culture is and what it means to be West Indian Caribbean within this industry. Like me as I'm just like a very teeny small cog in the wheel. But like I just for me, I always just try to be honest and just try to like be and and try to be as open as I can be. And also try to like dispel any myths that people may have about the West Indies and about Barbados that they may possibly have. Because I'm like, yeah, no, this is how West Indians and how Bajans think about something like this. And I'm just like, you guys have no idea how it really is in the Caribbean. I I will say too, as you're right, when you talk about this small group of creators that we currently have, where, you know, the, the reason why we have to look at that so importantly is that when it happens because international content you know like when i take certain meetings these days about certain ideas we always have to talk about whether the idea is domestic or whether it's international and there is going to be a time that i I actually even know i mean i can't even talk about it but i do know of some large studios i know of at least one large studio that is about to do something i think at least on the island of jamaica and we as the local creators have to be ready and prepared because we'll be the ones they're asking when they get to our respective places. Hey, how y'all do this? Right. And if you know, like I know with a lot of the islands where we have all of these ministries, right? We have government politicians uh, over art. We don't want those people. Love them to death for all that they do and all whatever positivity that they do. is nothing against them. I'm just saying that when it comes down to art and for where we are, for us not to continue to be the last place child all the way in the crew of people, right? We need to put forth our best. We need to put forth our best curators. We need to put forth the people who bleed our respective cultures. Even if it's a Bayesian who love Jamaica and a Jamaican who love Barbados, send them to the other islands. Because I do know that when West Indian people are able to talk with a freedom about anything that we are passionate about, yeah, man, that'll spread like fire. And if that could spread, that's what we need to have Hollywood working alongside with when they come to our spots, you know, so that the next pirates of the caribbean could be even greater than that because man no 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 they went to jamaica and they talked to what's his name because that's our fella in jamaica it's no different than they do it here they don't have just one star in hollywood you know they got multiple stars everybody this is my guy this is my guy over here this is my guy over here i'm just all of my stars are back home you know so i'm trying to make sure and ensure that they do end up being something man Mm-hmm. No, I, I hope for the best because like I, I can't wait to see people's reactions to this film because this film is going to be it's going to be interesting because it's not because um, it's not it's not what you expect. And one of the no. things about what you ex- when I wanted that you mentioned at the top um, about how you're inspired by the different lens, especially those from World War II era. I wanted to ask you with like going a bit into the technical side of it now is does that is that what inspired like the visual um the visual idea of the film because it uh, it has this this it had I don't know how to say but the way how I can expect is like I'm it looks and feels like it was something that I could have filmed it, it with my uh, myself back home and the way I the reason I'm saying that is like it lo- it has this very particular feel where like I'm looking through the bottom of a glass bottle right so I wanted to ask you about that because I thought it was very interesting because some of the some of the colors are very saturated and then like there's this kind of like this fuzziness and this kind of green to them and like all and then like and then it is it does look like you use a very particular type of lens for it so I wanted to ask if that was what inspired it no man I use whatever I could find um, <laughs> we just use whatever we could find and yeah all the inspiration is just back to you know I wrote it so it's that's a bit of a cheat at this point because it's like I knew what I wanted everything to look like. I had a vision in my head. It's like looking at old photos from my photo albums back home of you know stuff my grandparents. Would that's have it. Or that's yeah. 
but that's what that's what I call Mova Color. So that's something that I do with everything that I do. If you get a chance, like I said, check out Fire Queen. Fire Queen is the same way. Um, I remember even with Fire Queen, we used the old, old uh, Ikigami cameras of like the 80s, like those 80s uh, cameras, because we just got some stuff and we said, look, let's try this. And lo and behold, I get out here in Hollywood and I'm shooting this Lakers show for HBO. And what do we have on set? An Ikigami camera. So it's even when they first called me about doing the show and I spoke with Adam McKay, he said, look, you're already doing what we're doing. So mm -hmm. it's interesting when you hear that. And it's also it's, I think it's even more interesting when you realize, well, what we're doing was just from art. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we the wall and the wall said, well, now nah, you don't got no camera for this scene. And I said, well, shit, what do we have? And oh, you know what? Well, let's swap that out. Let's put this mount on that and put these glass, put this glass on it. And that's where just as a master painter would tell you, you know, this is how I mix the red with a little bit of orange to get the vermilion color, because that's what I remember from painting. That's essentially what I do with glass. So I'll take what we have. And I, over the years, I've I've collected quite a bit of lenses. Um, so I'll always make sure that we have lenses to choose from. The camera bodies to me just kind of became irrelevant. It was like, let's just capture the scene. Even going out there at night with Skimmer and Peter on the beach, it was only the three of us, nobody else. I actually ran the sound. Um, we just, our son was just born. So my son was four months old at the time. And my wife stayed inside because we were going to go film this at 1.30 in the morning on the beach when no one at all would be out there. Mm -hmm. So I showed up. We mic she, she mic'd them for me. And we showed up to film. And I remember having one light source. And I said, I just need that because, because I am a painter. I always make custom LUTs, you know, the lookup tables. That's all the technical stuff that we do. So I never just buy colors or looks from places like a lot of filmmakers buy looks and put them well essentially i create my own looks and that is from a lifetime and a history of painting right so with that lifetime and history of painting and understanding color and understanding um you know hollywood for a long time has used sort of like these teal hues against amber hues as a, yeah. a very film friendly palette and my way of that is just trying to sometimes go in and add a little magenta and add a little this and make something green pop like it's not supposed to like the, the background that you have there it reminds me of like some of our island teal it's darker but i know how i would like that and the thing it was just like you know there's a shot when parrot calls skimmer and skimmer's on the hammock in the kitchen and i, I love that shot because it takes him from like our inside outside mm -hmm. island kitchen which doesn't have four walls yeah and then he walks into the living room which is lit by like this old 1960s light fixture with red bulbs and the walls are the color of your walls. So then you just see that against our black skin and you're saying, okay, well, let me just get the, the tones of our skin rich and popping through. And so I'm painting as I go. And what I can say to that is there's no other technical aspect to it. I have to do technical things to make that happen. But because I am an artist and I'm painting as I go, the only thing I could tell you to that is I'm actually glad that you took it that way because the only the only safe face I have for that is at the beginning of all of these things, I always put up presented in Mova color. And Mova color is literally just what happens when a Rasta man smokes and looks at some footage at the end of the day. Because I do it at the end of every day. We get back at the end of the day. I always have whoever's doing my um, Tiny was our, our DIT for this one. So <laughs> Tiny would, would load up the footage and I would check out the footage. And I'll usually sometimes just ask them scoot over. I might have my spliff in my hand and I'll start to play with something because there's always a feeling on that day. Where we shot earlier while we were filming it, I might have felt like it was so warm that mm -hmm. I wanted to do something against that. And I really wanted to make a color in Peter's shirt really pop or something. And yeah, I'll do that until I just get dead tired and then I'll fall asleep and we get up. And I never look at any of these things again until we're done. But then I have this entire folder of LUTs, of looks. And it's just like, okay, so you have somewhere to start. And even if after that, I get on the plane and I come back to L.A. and a pandemic happens. And in the middle of a pandemic, I say, wow, <laughs> I, I should cut cheese up into a film. Huh? Like, like, I'm not doing anything. I should maybe do this. It's great when you pull it up at that time to have these looks that you did on a day when you were not. Because you're never going to remember that now. Yeah. You're not going to remember that when, it, when it's there. So... Yeah, it's very much a hands-on process for me, man. It's um, and you know, then then when it's all done, 
you know, Lou and I get together and score everything and we make, you know, just one of a kind pieces. Lou is actually the guy who plays Osiris. Um, and he's also a chairman, um, half of my scoring team. So he's just a very talented brother, man. Like he's, uh, he's in a band called Freetown that's out of Trinidad. They also perform in at, uh, uh, South by Southwest as well. So it's amazing what he's able to do sometimes with just strumming a little ditty on a guitar. And then before you realize it, that becomes all the walk we walk skim. I don't get no pay. <laughs> and yeah, it's, uh, you know, so it's nice to be able to make one of a kind thing so that when our audience or even when the outside audience watches what we make, nothing at all will ever feel like anything that they make. There will not be any music that sounds like dun, 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 dun. No, we, we want to go into song for that. And I think those of us familiar with island life also know that there's always from sun up to sundown a music blasting somewhere 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 music blasting man so um you know that is the whole palette for us is, is motion the color of it and the sound um that is that is sort of my wash and repeat process for everything that i do but i always try to make sure that they always one of a kind you know no no painting should be like the like the last painting it's not really a series in a painting the good thing for cheese however is this is actually the first of three so this is um this is a trilogy um yes you know where you ended it i'm just like my sister and i was just like wait that's it <laughs> so this um this will go on and we'll have two other parts so you know as we head to south by southwest i think one of the things that i'm interested in i know that the team is looking for is that it's not just a partner that will help us get this out, but someone that will also sort of invest with the long haul for us and say, yeah, let's head back, man. You know, if we were able to make this one for next to nothing, imagine what we could do with a little bit of resources for the next one. Mm. And um, you said something, because as I said, I was trying to figure out like, the wording for how I wanted to describe how the film looked. And you said something, and it was, I'm like, that's exactly it. Um, old photo albums. The old photo albums we used to like, have, you know, the one with the cellophane cover, that, 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 that's how it looks like. How, cause like over time the, the, the pictures change and like the colors kind of merge and bleed into each other, especially for the, the Polaroid ones. That's exactly okay. what it looks like. Yes, that's it, yes. That's, that's exactly what we did. So when you see like those super eight shots in the film that even have like the film, you know, like they're smaller than, they're not even full frame shots. It was just like, yeah, that's what, yeah. Let's do it. And, you know, as I said, when I came here, it was really refreshing to finally see that a major Hollywood project like this Lakers project was also doing the same thing because there were times on set. I'm like, wait, you guys are really we're really doing this. We're really using the Super 8 today. And yeah, because then you realize, OK, well, man, I'm around some other artists now. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm not just trying to mail in the typical thing that the audience sees on TV weekly. I'm here for that. So, yeah, that was that was always an inspiration. I keep up a lot of photos from home uh, just on my wall. I don't I don't Facebook, but my wall is my um, it's just pictures that I have. And, you know, that's all pictures of my grandmother, my father, my mother. Um, I, there's maybe a couple of them of me in there, but they just had a certain look. You know, that stock was able to do something. It was cheap film that people yeah. could have, you know, portable cameras. Right. Um, but yeah, I love the look of them. And I was just like, yeah, if I'm trying to make something one of a kind. And when you leave out of the major metropolitan of even the Caribbean islands, you know, the parts of them that's most city like. Mm -hmm. And you really get to behind God's back, as Skimmer and I call it. Yep. You find it kind of looks like those pictures. People's clothes, you know, people in village, the fashion isn't 2022. Mm -hmm. You know, the might be a little awkward like skimmer skimmer was wearing an inside out rockaway t-shirt most of the film right and yeah that's the bit but the thing was right even though that's not a 1982 or 83 picture let's make it look like a 1982 or 83 picture mm. and that was always the thing it was always just um sometimes i would even keep some old photos on me um some old stuff that i had at the family and I would pull those up at night and just look at it and say, no, no, no. You see how the dark colors just have a little purple in there somehow? Yeah. And the grain would also help in that, you know? So it wasn't, we didn't just want to make something that just looked like HD. You know, we wanted to make it look, or 4K, right? We wanted to make it look like, no, man, this really feels like something. Him and Rebecca breaking up on the beach, that entire color, not even breaking up, but when she first tells him that she's pregnant. The color look for that entire scene is off of an old picture, old, old picture I have of my mother going to a funeral with my father. 
And I just remember looking at that picture and my mother was adjusting the, um, the strap on her shoe. But the way that the sun was hitting the lens, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, I like this. And that became the look for Skimmer and Rebecca having their words on the beach because I said, yeah, this don't, you know, it's funny and it's all of that, but it needs to feel like something, man. And the old photos, it's like when you go through your old family pictures, you feel like you feel something when you see them, right? Like you feel like they were a little different or their their meanings behind things might have been a little different. So that was the um that is the inspiration behind Mova Color. It's a bunch of pictures of family from up in Mova from when we grew up, man. Mm, no, I I feel you because there's a picture I took um in Bathsheba the last time I went home, and I kind of have it graded the the setting for the for the po the picture is kind of has that kind of gradient, so I'm just like ah, kind of reminds me of Bathsheba. And speaking about Skimma and Rebecca, though, there's something I'm gonna have to ask you because I know you'll probably get you'll probably get asked about it, but from um, some other critics and other journalists. So you talked about her being pregnant, how she got pregnant, or the scene that we believe where she says she got pregnant because I don't think that child is his, that ain't his baby. But the scene. Uh where she said that she got pregnant, some people are going to ask him, like, what's going on here? Because that would be considered assault. It would be considered sexual assault. So for you, it, like, talk about that scene. It would. It would. And, and for that, we would probably have to get news cameras at the small island villages because <laughs> our, our, all of our family members have a story like that, man. Like, it's just, it was, it, it, trust me, it's common in mind. So... <laughs> You know, and because and, I neither writing came from my head. Um, what I would say is, I mean, yeah, I can't give that away. It will go left. You know, that question will be answered in the second installment of the trilogy. And, you know, and I think even after we watch part two, you will still say, is the child his? But I think, but I, but, it, but, but we also remember that this is the island of cheese. And just like when we met Skipper's father and he was a tree, what I, that's all I have to tell you is keep that cap on when you wonder not who Skimmer's child is going to be, but what Skimmer's child is going to be. Because as we will find out in the second installment is that the child is somewhat a product of Hortensia and her black magic. Mm. So just as Walter was banished to the trees many years ago because Walter was a wet man and Walter was, was horning Maria and all of that, you know, <laughs> you know, that's the thing, right? It's like being from the islands and you know this, Carolyn, you know, sitting down sometimes listening to your family talk, older family and they hear them going about, yeah, I remember when Sheila was horning Ricky and ting, 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 ting. Me, I sit in those rooms <laughs> silent and i'm writing up here because i'm like we're gonna make this into a movie we are going to make this into a movie and good lord what is that baby going to be so what i can say is that even for what i need to do for the baby for the second installment i need i need some budget to make this happen but it is if the first installment was anything the second one is going to be brilliant is going to be amazing it is um but yeah it will it will be a spectacle is what i can say <laughs> what continues with them and that love story uh even what i can tell you is it's not the end for parrot you know because parrot was like my favorite every time we had a scene with parrot i just knew i said this scene is gonna be good skimmer skimmer was like the main guy for a long time and then when we when we brought parrot into the production we were like uh, -uh like like the scene with him and skimmer talking about going to venezuela we just saw i think that might have been actually the first thing we shot with parrot and it was just like, you know what? Would you mind trying this? And then he would do it, and you'd be like, "He was great." I was looking at Parrot on the beach like, "This is a young Sydney Portier. This is he's br he's just brilliant, man! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. He has he has um he has the same thing that Skimmer has." but in a, di in a completely different lane. I think you're looking at two actors of completely different career paths. Mm. To me, you know? uh, for, for Parrot, the scene that really, I'm just like, he has it, is the scene where he goes to see Hortensia. There's just the, the just his facial expressions. Like when she says something, he's like, huh? And like, yeah. I'm like, that moment, I'm like, that, I'm like, that moment right there. This was yeah. like, I'm like, that was priceless. Can you like, excuse yeah. me? Uh -huh. Parrot. <laughs> Fenton is a is a talented talented dude man we he used to do these viral videos back in the day in trinidad 
And that's where we first met him. I think I did like a video or something for Marshall Montano back in the day. And yeah. we had cast him. We casted him to play the part of some guy named Chicken, I think, um, <laughs> um, in the video. And, and, he, and he just was always, you know, one of those people that you just turn the lens on and you know you're going to get something? Yeah. He's always been that person. What he's done since then is take it and craft it. And, you know, now he can turn it up. Now he can turn it down. He can say this. He could tell you when he messed up and say, give me again. And Skimmer as well. You know, they've, they've both become... They've both become like the pros that I work with here or who people would consider the pros, you know, where they know if they're standing in your light, they remember the blocking, they remember which hand for continuity. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing just to even see their growth over the years and to hear, you know, hear someone like you say that about them as well, because you've seen quite a bit, right? So I love the fact that you can say that because for me, sometimes I feel like when I keep telling them, like, they just look at me like, yeah, you just... You just keep wanting us to act in these crazy movies, so you'll say it. Like, no, they were great. And I, I, I listen. I had so much fun because we had no clue where this film was gonna go, and it's completely unpredictable. The tree, oh my god, the the dad is, is a tree. I'm like, yes. <laughs> That was, that was that was my acting debut. I actually I actually put those lines down in LA when we shot that on location in Tobago. It was just Lou uh, doing his thing, and Alexa was Alexa, my wife, our producer, was reading him uh, the lines. So when we got back and we cut the whole scene up, we just dropped out all of her audio. And someone just asked me one day, they was like, "Who is going to play Walter Eversley?" And then we needed to make the tree, so it was like a whole CGI thing and everything. So. We planned it all out. And the last thing at all that we forgot was we never cast anybody to play Walter. And I said, oh, shit. And I was there and someone just looked. It was like, well, what about you? And I said, all right. Yeah, let's let's go in, man. Let's let's put Walter down. And Walter became. Um, yeah, Walter. Walter came alive. Oh, Walter was telling me, man, who else are here talking to trees? I'm just like, well, I'm like, he has a point. <laughs> like, he has a point. Like, nobody else is going to Walter's still Walter. Even though he's a tree now, he's still Walter, right? And Walter, that man would say some smart shit like that. <laughs> and then, like, the weed, like, I put in my notes, like, the weed is potent. I'm like, the weed potent? Because the things that these people see, I'm like, they making some, the cheese. <laughs> the cheese and the weed potent. Like, you could put that as a tagline. You know what is it? I tagged it. The only time I mentioned it was in, um, I think, when it gets animated. There's an animated sequence in the film. Yeah, and I guess. Once he added that cheese to that weed, well, the potent increase. And while we were even sketching that out, we just wrote, we spelled potency all kind of wrong. And we just kept writing it down wrong because we, you know, that was the, the fun of doing posts on this project. You got a chance to really be your old island self and mm -hmm. ask questions that I wouldn't even usually get to ask on a production here because I'm around a bunch of island people. And we could just throw out things like, boy, how you feel your uncle would spell potency? And then men, men would just throw out a version of potency and you say, yeah, hold, hold that, hold that. We write it that down. And then we cross it out. And then we write it the next way, we cross it out. And then we write it a third and wrong way and leave that in the film too. For them to say, because when Skimmer's telling, yeah, yeah, no, I know all them big words too now. It's like you have to laugh at it because... We are still talking about our country island relatives. All of us have somebody back a yard still. And we all know a skimmer. That was the thing I think overall that sold me on doing this project, man. We all knew it. And it wasn't going to be something that just felt like, oh, this is for Trinis. Or this is for Bayesians. Or this is for this. I was showing this to people from different islands. And they were like, man, this feels just like where I'm from, man. And I said, all right, this is when I know. This feeling like all of our old pictures, not just pictures in Trinidad. This is, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to kind of, we spend so much time talking about how great our respective islands are. And I always have a dream of just all island people being together, man. Like, I, I'm so proud every time I see us. I remember when Rihanna went home and had the whole ceremony, you know, and I remember looking at their, their, their prime minister, right? And well, yeah, we'll see. Well, we got that, that's me. Uh, you, but now we are, um, a, we are a we have a president now, we are a republic, know, and that's why I was leading into that, right? But I just remember when I saw this woman, the pride I had as a West Indian, and not and not and not saying because we always see Rihanna on billboards, everything here, 
Mm. But the fact that for this one moment, this had nothing to do with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And it was just us. I feel real proud as an Islander, man. Just to see Rihanna walking down. I see this next strong woman that looking like a tante you wouldn't. Uh, that's why I like her too. Uh, she looked like a no-nonsense auntie. Yeah, and, yeah, Molly don't mess wrong. <laughs> and you have to love them because these women have been the pillars of all of our communities, no matter what island we are from. And I just remember that day saying, I can't wait for more of this. More of this for our people just to look at our people, man. And hence the reason I'm working so hard on trying to pitch some more shows and some more great ideas that you know we could really bring from from here with the expertise that the major studios have is what i'll say we are getting into what we are making down there and i hope to really just you know be a part of that one day man because i am as sure as i made cheese i am so proud of us as island people man i i find us to still be the most we we have vibes you know and and in this world you realize how much of an important thing that is Mm -hmm. uh especially when you do what you and i have done which is migrate to other places that that ain't anything like us you know is honestly it's our is our vibes that keep us going so cheeses for all cheeses for all those people too because i wanted to show how hard some of us try to get off that island that we on you know so i think a lot of people who have left as well that cheese is sort of a postcard of back home for them too to say that they were their they were their own skimmer once upon a time and they was willing to try anything to make it up out of here. No, it's true. Thank you so much for making the film and thank you so much to the casting crew. You guys did a phenomenal job. I can't I can't wait to watch it again. I'm gonna be laughing my head off again. Um thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, David. This was so this was great. <laughs> Not a ball, man. Seriously, you keep up the great work too, man. I'm proud of all of us out here just doing something, man. So is, you know, in order for this to be an industry, we all need each other. So I really appreciate the time.